Both Rai and Hill were taken aback. Upon closer observation, Rai identified her hero as Redman, but she thought she might be wrong because she believed Redman was like a fairy tale character from a hundred years ago. Kim asked what the place was now, looking at the nobles chattering in their chairs. Then he loudly told Panda that she said the kids would be there. Panda looked confused but then saw Rai, who was her student. Rai tried to call her while crying, and Panda immediately ran toward her. She uncovered Rai's mouth and teasingly asked if her trip to the city was okay, causing Rai to ask how she could joke right now. Rai hugged Panda tightly while crying hard. Then she told Kim that she didn't think his kids were there, making him angry. He accused her of falsely claiming that she and the kids were together from the start, and she fearfully apologized to him. Fuel angrily told his people that this was why he told them not to mess with the Fashion Street kids and asked why they had to interfere. Panda told Kim that the man was the boss of the gourmet company named Hyolo. She thought that if Kim could catch Hill, he might be able to find his kids. Kim teasingly asked Hyol, oh, why he would catch him when people from Blue Moon City couldn't even lock eyes with him daring him to try. Then the men in black suits appeared, and Hyolo told Kim that if he wanted to talk, he should get a proper appointment. The men in suits showed their sharp blades and asked Kim where he thought he was barging in so easily, calling him Filthy Red. They quickly launched toward him, slashing him continuously, and then pulled back, leaving him wounded with blood splattering everywhere. Hill thought it was over, but Kim told Hyolo that he would get that appointment at his funeral, showing the crushed head of one of Hyolo's men. Hyolo noticed that all of his men were down and dead on the ground, and the nobles were running away, making him wonder what happened, and if Kim had taken out his bodyguards in an instant. He called for the twins, and the twins immediately told him that they would stop Kim. Before we continue, take a moment to answer the question of the day. What is the worst superpower? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. Now, back to the recap. The twins jumped toward Kim, but Kim jumped toward them as well. Meeting them in the center, the twins launched their fists together, while Kim also launched his two fists. When their fists met, both of the twins' fists crumpled like paper, making them wince in pain. Kim then pushed their crumpled fists into their faces, telling them to get lost, and threw the twins back to Hyle O's side. The twins died with both of their fists dislocated, leaving Hill furious. Hill told Kim that it wasn't amusing, especially since the twins were the strongest in his security team. He expected Kim to at least act like he was struggling in the fight, but instead, Kim just grabbed Huel's neck, telling him to cut the nonsense. He then lifted Joel up in the air, demanding that he tell him immediately where he had hidden his kids. Huel directed Kim to look behind him, mentioning a child standing there, but informed Hill that it wasn't her he was seeking, but the nine kids he had kidnapped from Slum Street. Huel teasingly said that he had wondered why the kids were so good-looking despite being from the slums, but now he realized it was because a great person like him had been protecting them. He then informed Hill that the kids weren't there anymore. This angered Hill, and he ordered Hall to provide a proper explanation. Suddenly, someone lifted a butcher knife, and Rai shouted a warning for Hill to be careful. Hill referred to this person as Woodcutter, and commanded him to slice Kim up. Woodcutter complied and chopped Kim's upper body in half, glaring at him angrily. Joel went on to explain that higher-ups had taken those kids because they needed children without any status in Blue Moon City kids who could be mistreated without any fuss. He admitted that he was merely carrying out requests, locating these kids and delivering them. Hill then commanded Woodcutter to clean up the corpse and take care of the other intruder. However, Kim once again tried to grab Hill's neck, even while lying on the ground, and questioned him again about where his kids were. Then, miraculously, Kim's body began to regenerate. He told Hill that he had no reason to let him live. Rai was shocked witnessing this, but Panda expressed amazement at Kim's incredible healing ability. Hill wondered aloud how it was possible for Kim's body to recover so quickly after being bisected and assumed that Kim must be an ability user. Gasping for air, Hill calls for Woodcutter once again. Woodcutter slashes at Kim's arm, freeing Hill as he falls to the ground. Kim's hand is still clinging to his neck. Kim's hand swiftly regenerates once more, and he poses a question to Hill, asking if all his people know is how to wield blades. Woodcutter screams at Kim loudly, but he retaliates with an even louder scream, causing his red mask to shatter. The force of the scream is so great that Panda and Rai have to cover their ears. Woodcutter nervously retreats, dropping his knife, prompting Hill to angrily question what a killing machine like him could possibly be scared of. Hill orders Woodcutter to attack and mince Kim into ground meat. Woodcutter leaps and punches Kim in the face, following this with a flurry of punches. Kim retaliates by punching Woodcutter's head, turning it at 360 degrees. Then he lands more punches on Woodcutter's body, leaving large holes. This shocks Joel, who can't believe his eyes. Hill understands that Kim is not like the others he's seen many fear in his line of work. Kim is a real monster. Hill walks closer to Kim, stating that 
he finally sees an expression on his face worth observing. He positions his fist and asks Joel if he has any last words. Hill quickly says to wait, claiming that he is the chairman of Blue Moon City and that if touched, Kim would become a first-degree criminal, losing all leads on finding his kids. Hill then proposes a deal. He will help Kim locate his kids. Turning to Panda, he asks for her opinion. Panda states that High Olo is just a figurehead and has no real power to negotiate with anyone above him. As for finding the kids, she assures them they can easily do that with the help of a finger chain. She then strides toward Rai, loudly declaring they have no need for Hill while covering Rai's eyes. Hill grabs Panda's shoulder, agreeing that Panda is correct and concluding that Hyol O is useless. He thanks Panda for sparing him the mental effort, and now he can kill Joel in peace. Hill yells out in fear, but Hill simply throws a punch that explodes Hul's head, effectively ending the reign of the Gourmet Company. A moment later inside the office, Rai tells Panda that an older man from Finger Chain had died due to her actions. Panda is stunned and asks who it was. Ri replied that it was a person with wax in his hair and using a half mask. Panda figures out who it wasn't and laughingly asks Rai what she meant by older, noting that Herbie was only two years older than her and was 21. She then informs Rai that Herbie is alive and well, leaving Rai confused and questioning what she meant. Panda explains that Herbie's mission was to spy and he had covertly infiltrated their ranks. If the likelihood of help was low, their plan was to pass her a patch, and she'd join him by following that patch. She also told Rai that she and other Finger Chain members are trained to keep Blue Moon City in check, so there's no way Herbie would get hurt easily. By now, she speculates Herbie is probably taking a break on Fashion Street, so Rai shouldn't be too distressed. Rai found this odd, saying she definitely saw some monstrous creature kill Herbie, and loudly stated that the monster was still out there. Meanwhile, in the corridor, a monster with a long neck detected a strange man's scent, but it also noticed that a familiar smell was present. Kim was silently observing the monster when it morphed into a large mouth filled with sharp teeth and shouted, Bon Appetit. This led him to understand that it was a human face being sprouting that could also talk like a human. After defeating the monster, he asked Tansei, the gatekeeper, why he was inside its body. Tansai responded that he was exploring upstairs for clues about some kids and that monster suddenly attacked him. He hung in there as long as he could, but found it too challenging to handle alone, so he ended up getting eaten. Kim questioned if this meant that during the earlier chaos, Tansai took the opportunity to escape and got injured, to which Tansai affirmed. Panda then appeared, noting that Kim and Tansei were both there. Kim questioned her whereabouts, and she responded that she was in the chairman's office, but more importantly, they had decided on their next destination. She then informed him that they should head next to Giant Foods. Kim asked if it was also a big corporation, and she elaborated that both the Gourmet Company and Giant Foods were similar businesses, and their chairman had had a long-standing relationship to the extent that they were like brothers. She also clarified that the Gourmet Company, far from being a large corporation, had grown significantly due to giant foods and systems, given how much they exchanged information. Traces of their cooperation were evident. Panda then revealed that giant foods had taken Rai's sister, Ramo, along with one of Kim's students, Hyun Jiom. Kim examined the poster closely and recognized Hyun Jiom. She informed him that for the moment, while she had requested the tracking of other finger chain kids' locations, they could head to Giant Foods. Kim asked her which direction they should take, but she replied that she didn't know. Both of them then looked at Tansai, prompting him to plead for them to reconsider, warning that Giant Foods was perilous. Chairman Og had quelled a revolt, and he was a blue blood. Tansai emphasized that Og was on a different level, and they'd all be doomed. Kim asked Panda what blue blood meant, and she explained that it referred to the pillars of Blue Moon City and a select group of business magnates. He then asked Tansai why it was such a big deal, to which Tanzai responded that it might not matter to him, but Tanzai himself would certainly die. He then questioned Tanzai, asking if he'd prefer to die by his hands, prompting Tanzai to agree to guide them through the quickest route. Panda told Rai that she needed to go home and offered to accompany her to the exit, which Rai accepted. Rai felt a comforting warmth from her teacher's hand, which seemed to calm her mind. However, Rai pleaded with Rai to take her along, which led to an argument between Rai and Kim. Kim questioned Rai about wanting to accompany them to Giant Foods, and the rationale behind taking a child there. Rai insisted that she needed to go, but Kim refused. The argument continued until Panda agreed to let Rai come along. Kim was initially angered by Panda's decision and questioned her judgment. As tensions rose, Panda broke her red mask and a fragment of it hit her face, causing her to choke. 
Kim continued to express his concerns about taking Rai with them, but eventually relented, warning them not to hold it against him later for not trying to deter them more vigorously. Tansei noted Rai's courage, and Rai expressed gratitude to Panda for defending her. Panda admitted that she had initially wanted to discourage Rai as well, but recognized her special abilities and allowed her to come. Meanwhile, in a giant foods building, a man was busily devouring a large grilled meat dish. A clock alarm sounded, catching the man's attention. He informed Chairman Og that it was time to depart for the gourmet company, acknowledging the need to leave to avoid keeping his younger brother, Hyol O, oh, waiting. Kim and the others arrived at the zipper store, and they walked inside. Tensai informed them that it was a high-end store on the outskirts of downtown. The man and woman at the store welcomed them gracefully. Kim asked if the place they had to visit was just a clothing store, but Panda showed the patch again telling him it was not just any clothing store. She then showed the patch on the man, explaining that it was a hideout where the fashion street group stayed in the city. The man asked her what her business was there, and she replied that they were preparing for a mission. The man said he understood, and directed the woman to unzip a huge zipper on the wall, revealing a huge space behind it, which surprised Tansei and Rai. Then the woman at the zipper store told them to enter, and Panda explained that the boss of fashion street, Handsome, was the one who turned the wasteland into Fashion Street. He formed the group Finger Chain out of loyalty to protect Fashion Street, blending into the normal world and becoming Handsome's eyes, nose, and hands. This revelation surprised Rai, who thought it was just a group of vigilantes with dual roles. Panda clarified that even Zipper, an undercover business operating in Blue Moon City, was a member of the Finger Chain. Ray was resting on the sofa, as the man told Panda that locating the kidnapped slum kids was risky work, but since it was her request, he would try his best. Kim thanked the man, and Panda playfully remarked that Kim knew how to properly thank someone, which annoyed him. Kim asked what kind of person she thought he was, and she replied that she had never seen him not be angry. This led to Kim angrily slamming the table and shouting about crushing the city punks who had kidnapped the kids, waking up Rai. Kim apologized to Rai, and the man told him that his act of eliminating that evil corporation on his own had greatly moved them. They considered him their ally, given that they were against the city. The man mentioned that their hideout planted in the city was small, but their force was skilled. However, Panda pointed out the real problem, how the four of them would get all the way to Giant Foods without being detected by surveillance cameras and the police. Kim asked if the man and his group couldn't join them in the fight, but the man explained that their first priority was to remain shadows in the city and they couldn't reveal themselves so easily. Any conflict with the police could lead to a war between the city and the streets, so they should avoid it. The man then glanced at Tansai, indicating his mistrust of the police officer. Tansai suggested that they enter through a subsidiary company of giant foods called Bingo Delivery, which specialized in frozen goods delivery and had installed pipes all over the city to keep goods from melting. While they considered this idea, Kim mentioned that they should go right away, but the man advised him to take some clothes first. Tansy pointed out that they were on the outskirts, so they didn't need to hide there, but it wouldn't be advisable to walk around the city half-naked. Panda told Kim that they had the perfect clothes for him, and the man offered to help him find suitable attire. Meanwhile, at the Gourmet, a large carriage arrived, escorted by many cars. Chairman Og and his associate Barry got out of the carriage, but they were shocked to see the gourmet company in disarray. The chief, a hidden employee, explained that an unidentified man in a red mask had killed Huel and other employees who resisted him before disappearing. The chief mentioned that the red masked man was an invincible monster who didn't die, no matter how many times he was stabbed. Barry asked about the red masked man's comrades, including a police officer, a woman wearing sunglasses, and a young girl. The chief informed Barry that they had headed toward downtown, and Barry pondered whether the police officer was genuine or in disguise. He realized that the situation was not simple and was by thank the chief for the information. However, Barry's actions took a dark turn as he unexpectedly grabbed the chief by the neck, causing the chief to choke. It was fortunate that this incident had occurred on the outskirts of the city, so the news hadn't spread far. The chief, struggling for breath, turned to Mary, bewildered, and asked why Barry was doing this to him. Barry, with a twisted smile, nonchalantly explained that it wasn't a big deal. He was merely curious about why the gourmet company had chosen to build their headquarters in such a desolate place, known for its lack of good deeds. Barry claimed that he was just trying to make things worse for them. In a grim turn of events, the chief succumbed to Barry's ruthless grip, falling lifeless. Without hesitation, Barry opened his jacket and unceremoniously stuffed the dead chief inside it. He believed that even those who had managed to survive in that forsaken place and had witnessed the gruesome act would take quite some time to escape and report what had happened. Meanwhile, OGG, infuriated by the news of his friend's death in the Blue City, angrily called for Barry to answer for his actions. He ordered Mary to track down the individual responsible for the heinous act 
and bring back the kid's lifeless body for him to deal with. Barry, showing respect for OGG's authority, bowed and assured him that he would hire a skilled assassin to eliminate the person responsible. In a different part of the city, inside the zipper store, Panda and Kim discussed their clothing options. Kim was amazed by the quality of the clothes, especially the ones crafted by Handsome. These clothes had unique features like shock absorption and self-recovery, making them stand out. Tim chimed in, expressing how comfortable the clothes felt when he wore them. Panda emphasized that Handsome's collection included rare and customized pieces that money couldn't buy, and she had cleverly tailored them for Kim. As Kim emerged from the dressing room in a stylish leather jacket with the word red line on it. Panda explained that it was meant to increase their chances of success in their upcoming plan. Kim corrected her, saying they were letting him borrow it, not giving it to him. Panda accepted the correction, and Kim asked if they were ready to go find the kids. Meanwhile, in the bingo delivery building, a man in a white dress entered the scene, taking his place alongside other workers. He observed the soldiers and greeted them with a cheerful, good morning. The soldiers reciprocated the greeting, addressing him as their chief. The chief informed the soldiers that they had received a message from Giant Foods regarding an incident at the gourmet company's main store, resulting in its temporary closure. He promised to provide more details after they completed their current deliveries. With enthusiasm, he motivated the soldiers to give their best, emphasizing that not even the cold freezer could dampen their passion. The chief then asked the soldiers to identify themselves, but he found their voices too soft. He instructed them to speak louder, and the soldiers complied by shouting their identification. Still not satisfied, the chief demanded even more volume, and they immediately raised their voices. He then ordered one soldier to open the shutters, and an alarm sounded as the massive ice blocks were gradually revealed. The icebreakers sprang into action, swinging their weapons to break apart the enormous ice blocks in their path. Following them, the distribution team took their turn, directing specific products to different pipes for delivery. The soldiers executed their tasks with precision, impressing the chief with their excellent work. As the operation continued, a man in a full white outfit questioned the chief's resistance to the cold, noticing that his clothing seemed to be getting thinner. The chief dismissed the concern, attributing his warmth to his unwavering passion. Just as they puzzled over the cause of another alarm, the shutter began to open once more. To their surprise, Kim greeted everyone with a cheerful, good morning, and referred to them as his comrades. This unexpected arrival left them all bewildered. Rewinding time by 30 minutes, Kim had been examining the files of clothes, concerned about the potential for theft in a city where people were so careless with their possessions. Panda reassured him, insisting that there were no thieves in the city. Perplexed, Kim asked if there were truly no thieves at all. Tansai, who had been with them at bingo delivery, chimed in, explaining that there had been instances of robbery, but the culprits weren't common thieves. Instead, it was the men from rival businesses who were responsible for these incidents. Tansai also disclosed a disturbing piece of information he had been pondering since their arrival at Bingo Delivery. He had heard about a mysterious blacklist that large corporations shared among themselves. Individuals on this list had all mysteriously vanished, and when their families reported them missing, Police investigations revealed that they had all frozen to death under mysterious circumstances. Tanze went on to reveal that his senior had always warned him that bingo delivery was a suspicious enterprise. It didn't appear to be what it seemed from the outside, and Kim quickly deduced that it was involved in contract killings. Rai asked if that meant they were dealing with a formidable organization, to which Tanze confirmed they must be, given that the chief had been a fighter known as Mad Dog, responsible for enough killings to get banned. Panda declared that they needed to proceed with their plan and confront the situation head-on when they reached their destination. However, the chief warned them that only authorized personnel were allowed inside. Kim, displaying his characteristic audacity, confidently walked in, dismissing the chief's authority. He challenged the chief to try and stop him, launching a powerful punch that sent the chief crashing hard into the wall, creating panic among the soldiers. As the commotion ensued, a man in a white suit observed the chaos, seemingly unfazed by the situation. The guards, whom Tansai referred to as the Icebreaker Soldiers, rushed towards Kim. One of them swung an ice hammer at him, but Kim shattered it with his bare hand, leaving the soldier stunned. Kim then effortlessly incapacitated the soldier with a single punch, sending him collapsing before his comrades. The remaining soldiers began to panic, questioning whether Kim possessed superhuman abilities. The man in the white suit, curious about their fear, asked who they were. The soldiers identified themselves as bingo delivery employees and charged at Kim. Kim, undaunted, invited them to come at him. Kim single-handedly took on the soldiers, leaving the man holding the documents behind, confused about the sudden turn of events. Unbeknownst to him, someone crept up from behind and swiftly snapped his neck, 
causing him to fall lifeless to the floor, releasing the documents. Panda seized the opportunity to retrieve the documents, remarking on the effectiveness of the plan. While they continued walking, Panda read from the documents that in Pipe B-44, there was a fork in the road, requiring a staff member to steer the item. She assured them that they just needed to get on the ice and proceed. Tansei, however, was nervous and voiced his concerns about slipping on the ice. Unfortunately, his fears became reality as he slipped and accidentally knocked Rai over. Their fall caught the attention of nearby soldiers, and Rai chastised Tansai for being more careful. Tansai explained the slippery floor, but it was too late. One soldier noticed them and shouted that there were intruders not wearing work shoes. Panda removed her goggles and called Kim for assistance. Kim grumbled about doing all the hard work and being caught despite it. Kim then pushed the soldiers aside and rushed towards his teammates. He grabbed Panda, Rai, and Tansai by their shoulders and hurled them upward. Fortunately, they landed on top of the ice. Panda instructed Kim to aim them into pipe B-44. Kim positioned himself, told them to go first, and then kicked the item into the pipe along with them. It glided on its own path like a roller coaster, eliciting shouts of fear from the trio. Meanwhile, one of the soldiers informed the man in the white suit that the intruders had entered pipe B-44. The man responded that they would chase them down. Kim, however, blocked the entrance to pipe B-44 asking them where they thought they were going. The man in the white suit calmly requested that Kim first finish the fight he had initiated. Puzzled, Kim was then pushed away and pinned down by the chief. Kim questioned why the chief was still alive after his powerful punch. The chief teased him, saying it was a waste to lie down when there was a wild guy like Kim around. Meanwhile, at a huge gate in the slums, an investigator inquired if three co-workers had gone missing when they changed shifts. The officer confirmed that two of them were not the type to disappear without a word raising suspicions about their sudden absence. Back at the slum gate, the investigator pondered the mysterious disappearance of the three co-workers. He couldn't help but think that all traces of evidence had vanished, as if someone had meticulously cleaned up the crime scene. He considered the possibility of an outsider invading, as there were no records on the central server regarding the opening and closing of the main gate. He knew that if their opponent possessed superhuman abilities, it was entirely plausible. The only clue they had was the damaged main gate. The city's main gate was constructed from special raw materials, making it difficult to repair quickly. Additionally, the investigator noted that new asphalt had been laid on the road, suggesting that evidence inside the city might have been destroyed as well. One of the police officers abruptly ordered everyone to evacuate, leaving the other officers bewildered and questioning the decision. The officer explained that the incident was minor, merely involving the dismissal of the missing trio for going AWOL. The investigator asked if leaving their work area was unusual, to which the police replied that it might be unusual, but wasn't a significant concern. This response frustrated the investigator, who pressed the police officer, asking if he was sure. The police officer, irritated, questioned if the investigator was implying that he could be lying, he advised the investigator to consult his superiors if he didn't believe him, and emphasized that Esten had jurisdiction there, warning the investigator not to interfere with their affairs. The police then departed, leaving Esten frustrated and questioning who had the authority to interfere with the investigation. Meanwhile, inside Pipe B-44, the product slid down rapidly. The soldiers and the man in the white suit were in hot pursuit. One soldier lunged to attack, but Panda pulled Rai down just in time to avoid the attack. She then kicked the soldiers, causing them to fall back. Rai, frustrated, lashed out at a soldier who was climbing onto the product with a suitcase, berating Tansai for his slip-up and expressing frustration that it had put them all in danger. Tansai, in turn, felt distressed and argued that he hadn't slipped on purpose. Amidst their argument, the man in the white suit suddenly appeared among them, questioning if they had time to bicker. He landed in front of them, leaving them in shock. As he did so, the platform they were on broke in half separating Panda and Rai from Tansai. Rai noticed that the man had cut the ice, and Panda speculated that he might have used skate blades. Tansai, frustrated, called the man a lunatic, and was irked that he had been separated from the others. Rai expressed her concern, calling out for Tansai. Panda realized that she had misunderstood the situation. She initially thought that the man fighting Kim was their leader, but it turned out that their actual boss was present. The chairman, the director of Ice Chamber Dispatch, clarified that he was from another company, but still held a higher position. He angrily questioned how they dared to mess with bingo delivery. Panda launched herself at the chairman, declaring that she wasn't a mercenary but a teacher. The chairman raised his leg, dismissing her attack as a mere joke. However, Panda also raised her leg, and their legs collided, creating a significant impact. The chairman admitted that he had underestimated her, now realizing that she resembled someone he knew. Rai observed a shining light above, which then broke apart. She warned their director to be cautious. Panda utilized her Salchow skill to attack, 
stating that the chairman's accompanying employees had become obstacles. The chairman suggested taking it easy, but Panda evaded his kick and countered, breaking his goggles in the process. Meanwhile, Tanzi realized that he wasn't being pursued and grew frustrated, thinking Rai believed he had fallen on purpose. He chuckled at Rai's supposed cleverness and questioned why he'd help someone from the streets. Relieved that the path had branched, he planned to exit, request backup, and attempt to reverse the events that had transpired. On the other hand, within the confines of the bingo delivery building, a massive product was being discarded. Kim, in his relentless pursuit, forcefully punched the product, causing it to shatter into pieces. At that very moment, the chief appeared, holding another product in his hands. He praised Kim, telling him he was the best, and then hurled the new product toward him. The impact of the collision sent Kim flying back, crashing into a wall with tremendous force. Rising to his feet, the chief expressed his opinion that fighters from the city tended to overcomplicate battles with various techniques, finding one-on-one -on -one fights tedious. Kim, however, was uninterested in the chief's philosophical musings and lunged at him to attack. The chief easily intercepted him, admiring Kim's qualities and suggesting they could become great friends. In response, the chief forcefully slammed Kim's head into the floor, but Kim, with his head still beneath the floor, informed the chief that he had chosen his words poorly. Kim's swift retaliation saw the chief's feet lifted into the air, and Kim swung him around while firmly stating that he had no interest in becoming friends. He released his grip, hurling the chief across the room. Kim positioned his fist backward and delivered a powerful punch to the chief's stomach, causing the chief to cough up blood and slam against the wall with considerable force. Kim clarified that his only interest lay in the well-being of his children and began walking toward the B-44 pipe. The chief, expressing his surprise at Kim being a married man, suggested that now that they were both warmed up, they should engage in a proper fight. Facing the chief, Kim asserted that any other opponent would have already met their end and inquired if the chief possessed any superpowers. In response, the chief, ripping his uniform to shreds, acknowledged that he did indeed possess a superpower that allowed him to transform his muscles into a stronger form. Kim, derisively referring to the chief as a cockroach, charged at him. The chief, running toward Kim, expressed gratitude for the compliment and revealed he had a collection of 30 cockroaches at home. They then engaged in a fierce exchange of punches to each other's faces, their anger intensifying with each blow they delivered and received. The chief found the fight exhilarating and laughed heartily, but Kim remained silently focused as he continued his relentless attacks. When their fists collided, the tremendous impact generated a noticeable distance between them, but Kim quickly regained his position. The chief, still laughing, informed Kim that he couldn't win against him, explaining that his superpower allowed him to transform any hit he received into muscle mass. He teased Kim about what his next move would be. Before we continue, let's take a moment to shout out at Asadino01 who commented, literally my favorite man wa on our real estate developer video. Thanks for commenting. Chief punched Kim in the face and chest, sending him crashing forcefully into the wall. However, when the chief launched another attack, Kim successfully avoided it, leaving the chief bewildered. The chief questioned Kim's change in strategy, wondering why he had been absorbing hits and if he had lost his desire to fight. Despite Kim's silence, the chief recognized that he was at a disadvantage and needed a new approach. In a sudden move, the chief leapt toward Kim, but instead of dodging, Kim grabbed the chief's waist, leaving the chief puzzled. Kim managed to pin the chief down and took hold of his neck, shifting from striking blows to a grappling technique. The chief remarked that using grappling techniques against his skill set was a clumsy move and twisted his hand around pinning Kim to the ground. However, the unexpected happened. Kim's arm began to regenerate. The very hand that the chief was still holding suddenly punched the chief, leaving him baffled. Kim seized the opportunity to pin the chief down and declared victory. The chief retorted by saying that Kim had called him a cockroach, but he was even worse. Undeterred, Kim forcefully slammed the chief onto the floor and dragged him at a fast pace. During this, the chief questioned whether this would change the outcome, stating that no matter how desperate Kim's counterattacks were, he would ultimately emerge as the victor. Kim, ignoring the chief's laughter, threw him with significant force against the wall, creating a loud and explosive sound. The chief realized that he had been thrown into an in-stop freezer, angering him further. He accused Kim of orchestrating the whole episode to lead him there and adjusted the freezer to its maximum temperature. With the freezer door slowly closing, Kim informed the chief that he had heard about his lethal methods involving the freezer. Finally, as the door closed completely, Kim posed the question to the chief, who was now trapped inside. How about you get a taste of your own medicine? The chief instantly lunged for the freezer door, angrily labeling Kim a coward. Grasping the door, the chief menacingly told him not to try to escape their fight, 
However, Kim struck the chief's face, pushing him backward, and countered, asserting that he wasn't running away. As the chief tumbled inside, he declared the chief the loser of the fight, and the freezer door closed, leaving him standing alone outside. Suddenly, the chief's hand pierced through the freezer door in a last-ditch attack, but Kim caught it and told the chief that he remained repulsive to the end. The chief's hand slowly froze as he mused about whether all individuals with superpowers had to be as abhorrent as he was. Meanwhile, inside a large pipe, ice shards were flying around as Panda fought tirelessly against Chairman. She launched a powerful attack that Chairman narrowly dodged, and he retaliated, but she managed to evade his strike, albeit with some difficulty. Rai, concerned for her teacher Panda, was surprised to see her as a skilled fighter, realizing that Panda was not as lazy and relaxed as she had thought. What will happen next? Find out next time by staying tuned for our future recaps. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great recaps.